Hi, I'm Mark Gorton, and I'm here today with Tom Vanderbilt, author of the book Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do and What It Says About Us. And I would personally like to endorse this book. It is one of the best, most readable books on the subject of traffic and transportation, which is admittedly a somewhat obscure genre. It seems like one of the big themes in your book, and, and you have whole chapters on this, is almost how completely unaware drivers are of their own behavior and the own implications of their behavior. I sometimes wonder if I should have called the book feedback because we're, so much about this is just people responding, whether traffic in general or the way we behave in an automobile is responding to feedback. And you drive to work, you come home, you may have been involved in some sort of close calls. You may have, there may have been situations where you wouldn't have been able to avoid something had it gone wrong, but we don't, we don't sort of get those messages. And, and every day that you don't get into a crash it sort of emboldens you. Uh, is a company called DriveCam, is that, is that what it's called? That, what they, I mean, why don't you describe what they, what they do? And they have a little uh, sort of dashboard mounted camera or rear view window mounted camera that uh, is sort of like a TiVo, it's always recording. And then they also have some accelerometers uh, in, in the device and some of them have GPS as well, so it's all sort of synced up. And whenever there's kind of a hard braking event or, or a steering event, uh, the camera responds and captures that moment. Uh, this camera sort of opens the window onto the, this inner life of, of the driver, which I think uh, has been sort of unknown for, for many decades. Until you could actually get some kind of unobtrusive technology into a car, how did you know what people were really doing? People can then get coaching. They can see where they've made mistakes. Uh, they're, they're, this myth that they're the, sort of the perfect driver has been shattered. A lot of time, these cameras are recording events which the drivers are not aware themselves because they are fiddling with something in the car or you know, texting or maybe even dozing off. And I mean, it's sort of amazing that you have these situations where the driver is completely unaware of what's going on. And sometimes these cameras are filming like people on the street who are almost getting killed. And Unless the camera captured this, the driver would have no idea that it happened because they were distracted. There's uh, the famous gorilla video uh, by, by Daniel Simons, the cognitive psychologist. They have a book coming out called The Invisible Gorilla. Their whole idea is when you're, you might be looking for something else, uh, you might be looking for a car, for example, at an intersection, is a car coming? If something comes along that doesn't match the sort of attentional set of what your mind is primed to see at that moment, you may, in fact, miss it, even though you're looking right at it. And they call these looked but did not see crashes, which is a curious phrase. One of the things that you get from, from your book is this sense that, I mean, drivers, there's something about the bubble of the car that kind of disconnects people from the outside and that people are almost kind of completely unaware of the impact that their driving has on people outside the car. Yeah, I think both, both philosophically and, and literally, I mean, they do interesting tests where they kind of cover the speedometer with, uh, you know, tape and then put people in different sorts of cars, cars that have a quieter cabin. People actually drive measurably faster in cars with quieter cabins. And I was just looking at an ad for the new uh, Acura has all sorts of noise canceling, active noise canceling technology that screen out unwanted engine noise and sort of making the cabin yet even more quiet, reducing another source of the sort of feedback that's coming through the cabin and just kind of shutting the driver off from that external world. And of course, we're, you know, now we're reaching, drivers themselves are now taking that a step further by, of course, engaging with mobile devices, which if you thought it was bad before, that, that level of separation now, you know, it's, it's gone beyond a whole, other, by a whole other order. Let me see if I can find this in your book. Vehicles are moving at velocities for which we have no evolutionary training. For most of the life of the species, we did not try and make interpersonal decisions at speed. And, and it's real, I mean, again, I, we live in a city where you have this interaction between people moving down the street at pretty fast speeds and the people who are on that street and how they're almost in completely different worlds. You probably begin to lose eye contact at around 20, 25 miles an hour. That's exactly when the sort of level of potential pedestrian fatality really begins to soar. Up to 20 miles an hour, a pedestrian still has a pretty good chance of, of surviving a crash with a car. But beyond that, it really begins to accelerate. So just at that moment when we've sort of cut ourselves off from the eye contact is really that moment w at which we're not evolved to be able to survive a an impact. So just an interesting sort of suggestion that's been put out there. A lot of times you see somebody you know, do something that's really reckless, like that almost kills another person. And then you look in the car and it looks like, you know, just like the nicest little old lady or something like that. And you kind of wonder like, how is it that someone who clearly would never almost push someone down the stairs or off the edge of a, a cliff or something, but they almost hit them with a car going 30 miles an hour. 
Yeah, I think the key factors are, are anonymity and, again, lack of, of feedback. And this is something that, you know, uh, anonymity, if you look at internet chat rooms as a famous example, if you're signing on with, it's not your real name, you lose that sort of impulse to sort of behave in, in, a, in a civic manner, or there's less of a, there's less sort of social glue holding you together. When you're in a city, just turning through an intersection, and, and again, in a density like, like New York with a lot of people, you know, there are times people you know, really kind of force their way through an intersection with a car. And again, you, you talk about how almost people try very hard not to make eye contact because then they're not responsible for their actions somehow. You know, the Chicago police did do some of these stings. I think the stings, the sort of blitzes are worthwhile to kind of raise the profile of some of these issues. And the, the troubling thing was when they sort of pulled the drivers over and started talking to them to issue the ticket, a high amount of people just weren't aware that they were actually doing anything wrong. They say, oh, the light was blinking. The, the don't walk light was blinking as if that meant the pedestrian couldn't be in the crosswalk. Uh, so there's sort of a fundamental, in some ways, misunderstanding or lack of understanding about, about traffic laws. It's far too easy to get a license. It's far too difficult to lose one in, in this country, I think, for you could have multiple DWI infractions. I mean, the most egregious acts of aggressive driving, you, you're still holding a license. Basically, the only feedback people get is when they get a traffic ticket or if they're in a crash. And you know, those things happen once every several years for, mo for the average person, or even if they happen a lot. Yeah, and even so. in those cases, you know, based on, you know, on cognitive dissonance and some other psychological theories, there's a, a wonderful book called uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. They use the example of going to one of these traffic schools, which you have to go to in Los Angeles if you've racked up enough points on your license. They're, they're sort of a joke. They actually don't improve traffic safety according to the studies that have been done, but you sort of go there and you sit through some some lessons for a while, and, and people are asked to explain what they did, and you sort of go around the circle, and you know, no one owns up. They're, they're all sort of, it was the other guy, it was, uh, you know, and this gets into just one other psychological thing I want to bring up, one other phenomenon, uh, which is, I think, important in traffic, called the fundamental attribution error. And this is when, when we see someone else do something, psychologists argue, it's, it's easy for us to blame or attribute the reason for what they did to something about that person, about their nature. When we ourselves are uh, asked to explain why we did something, we, we tend to blame situational factors. And a way to think about this is to say, uh, you fell, I was pushed. So I, you know, that sort of thing happens all the time in traffic, where we're sort of making these snap judgments about other people. And this gets in what I was talking about with sort of the modal conflict. Uh, we, we tend to, people don't really understand what a cyclist might have, might have to do while on a cycle, so they sort of attribute it to some kind of, something about that personality, well, that's a cyclist. Whereas a driver, they might be more willing to forgive because you know, it's something they're more familiar with. So again, I think that's just another form of this disconnect. I think e even the people in, in charge of traffic enforcement don't understand the strong correlation between speeding and severity of crashes and just even being able to react quickly enough. And a lot of these behaviors, I think now you, you see a lot of concern about texting because it is so extreme. But just anything that can distract you at all, even you know, tuning the radio in the car, that all of these behaviors create the dangerous situations which will probabilistically lead to crashes. And so if you want to solve the problem and, and really reduce the number of crashes and injuries and deaths, you have to go after these root causes. You have to go after speeding. You have to go after red light running. You have to go after reckless driving. You have to, you know, to some extent, you know, re-engineer the road to make those things happen. Exactly. You know, and I, while, I, while I sort of like to bang on about you know, personal responsibility, and people do need to sort of you know, step up in that regard, but, but you know, just we know that accidents are, are going to happen. I mean, we're humans. We're not, we're not perfect. Things are going to go wrong. So again, to go back to this idea of the forgiving road, I mean, one of the things that was always sort of left out of that equation was if you reduce speeds, drivers have more time to forgive their own errors and, and, and prevent something from, from going wrong. And that's, again, something that's sort of been left out of the equation. And we've gotten obsessed with things like removing obstacles from roads when, you know, in fact, the obstacle may in some sense actually be the safety device. Well, thanks a lot for being here. And once again, an excellent book for anyone who is interested or you know, having to deal with the topic of traffic. It's very informative and shockingly entertaining given the, uh, the topic.